Welcome to Mormon Book Reviews, where an evangelical encounters the restoration. So my channel has been going on for a little over a month now, and I've had this great opportunity to interview some wonderful guests and review some great books. And the opportunity I was able to come across was an individual who I greatly admire from afar. I uh, got to know him through uh, some of Rod Meldrum's Come Follow Me uh, podcast, and really was impressed with the gentleman. And so I reached out to him and he graciously accepted my invitation to come on to my uh, podcast. So I wanna tell you a little bit about the book we're going to talk about. We're going to, this is going to be kind of our guide. Um, we're gonna basically discuss um, the book Moroni's America. And in particular, we're gonna be discussing the idea of the heartland model for where the Book of Mormon took place. Um, when I started engaging uh, Mormonism, I generally would just go by what the scholars said. So the idea that um, Guatemala was the place I thought was pretty well universally accepted, uh, that Joseph used a seer stone, that this is what all the scholars believed. But then when I encountered Rod's podcast, I realized, okay, wait, there's another side to this. There's the believer's side. There's the believers who sit in the church pews side. And not only do they have a side, but they have a very articulate messenger that has something to say for the heartland model so when i reached out to jonathan he was very gracious to accept the invite and it really means a lot to me and it's really important this channel is about the full spectrum of the restoration all are welcome here this is a safe space for all and we're going to have a respectful christian dialogue with everyone so without further ado i want to introduce my newest guest jonathan neville who has quite a bibliography of books. He's an accomplished attorney. He's written books in many different genres. And not only is his uh, bibliography uh, very impressive, but the, he as an individual is impressive as well. Jonathan, welcome to the show. Thank you, Steve. I'm glad to be here. So um, what did you think when this evangelical uh, reached out to you? What, what, what was your first thought about an evangelical reaching out to you about your specific um, book and worldview? Well, you know, um, there's lots of a range of evangelicals. <laughs> some some are antagonistic, some are friendly, some are seeking for um, unification or at least areas where we can all work together to bring people to Christ. And I sense that you are that latter latter category, because I, you know, we had some some short conversations, and I'd seen you participate in some of those other uh, Zoom meetings and so on. And although even if you're antagonistic, I'd be happy to talk to you. But <laughs> but you just have a, a demeanor and an approach that is appealing to me and I think to a lot of other people. Well, thank you, Jonathan. I, I do appreciate it. And, and the encouragement is uh, I really do appreciate that. So first of all, I just want to kind of getting into the book. So we're going to use the book as our jumping off point. Um, in your dedication, you say this is open, dedicated to all open minded people. I thought, well, that's a I appreciate that. And uh, so I thought that's the spirit of the book, dedicated to open-minded people. You open up with a story about going to uh, Mars Hill mm -hmm. and seeing where the Apostle Paul engaged the uh, pagans, right? Right. And you went there with your family, and you, mm -hmm. and you realized you saw Scripture come to life because you were in an actual place that Scripture happened. That's and right. that really impacted you, correctly? Yeah, so, you know, it was really the first time that I related any religious scriptural stuff to the real world. And, and I still remember doing that. A couple of years ago, my wife and I went back to Athens. We were on Mars Hill again, and it brought that back to my memory because I was a teenager, you know, 15 or 16 years old. I didn't really pay that much attention to scriptural stuff. But when my dad told me this is where Paul stood i hardly even remembered who paul was but then i went to the scriptures and read that account and i started thinking that all right these scriptures are telling real stories about real people and real events and that completely changed my attitude towards uh, the scriptures in particular but even religion actually so it came to life for you real place yeah. real events but then you believed growing up that basically the Mesoamerica model was the, the standard model. That was what you were taught, generally speaking. And you just yep. assumed that was correct. And then interestingly enough, you went to Mesoamerica mm -hmm. and you went to those sites and you had a little bit different uh, eye-opening yeah. experience, correct? Yeah, I did. It was, 
when, when I went down to several of those sites, I thought, you know, this doesn't really feel to me like what the Book of Mormon describes. And I'd read about him, you know, I'd read John Sorensen's books and, and all the farms material and so forth. And so I anticipated something that was different than the reality when I got there. And so I thought, well, maybe the Book of Mormon just uh, was too vague or wasn't, didn't use the right terminology to describe these locations. But they certainly didn't fit. And, and the idea of particularly there is a disconnection in my mind between Mayans kind of speaking in King James English, which was another problem for me. But it really was visiting those sites was quite different from visiting the Old Test or the Old and New Testament sites. So it just didn't it didn't jive with you at the time. Right. And right. that makes sense because when you do look at so, you know, to all, all my friends out there who, you know, ascribe to different models, not here to mock or anything uh, or disparage. But when you go through Guatemala and you look at the structures, they look pagan. Right. There's there's nothing you have uh, graven images everywhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, that that sometimes just seems a little doesn't doesn't seem like it would have been somebody from a Jewish background that would have created these structures. Exactly. So uh, it is an interesting thing. So you um, so you realized, OK, something isn't right here. And then you're thinking, probably, well, if they didn't happen here, where did they happen? And where did that investigation lead you to? Well, I, I kind of just so-called put it on the shelf, right? Mm -hmm. Because I thought, well, there's probably an explanation. These scholars have been studying it for a long time. I had been following them for decades, you know, and I pretty much bought into the whole concept that uh, John Sorensen, Jack Welch, Stan Peterson, those guys always talk about. But then there was a, an advertisement here in, uh, that I saw for a presentation by Wayne May about a Book of Mormon geography thing. And I went to one of his presentations and he talked about the North American setting, which I'd never really had heard of before. And, but again, that, it seemed a little outlandish, I guess, in a sense at the time it was new to me. And then a mutual friend introduced me to Rod Meldrum and I was talking to Rod about it. He said, well, you need to see these places for yourself. If you travel to the Middle East and Central America and around the world, you got to see it for yourself in Ohio. And I thought to myself, I've driven through Ohio. I'd, you know, I'd, it wasn't like a, a famous spot that I was excited to go to. But I thought, well, yeah, he had a good point. If I've seen these other sites, I should see Ohio. So I went out there. And that was really what really flipped my whole worldview was seeing in the museums and in the physical locations these um, artifacts and structures and things that, to me, uh, were described by the Book of Mormon. And the most interesting thing about it is, um, you know, you can almost, so basically the civilization that you were observing, primarily I'm assuming was the Hopewell, right. and you can use secular archaeology and you can overlay the time periods that the secular scholars use to say this is the Hopewell period, and mm -hmm. they do correspond roughly pretty good with the Book of Mormon. Right. So now they're called Hopewell just because they were found at a farmer's um, place. His last name was Hopewell. They didn't call themselves Hopewell, right? Right. So um, that's the reality. Well, on, on that point, we like to say that if the, the man who owned that first mound, if his last name was Nephi, we'd be calling him Nephi. Nephi. Of course. <laughs> or too bad there wasn't a Mormon on the archaeological crew. Maybe he would have come up with that idea. <laughs> yeah. Good, good have. <laughs> but uh, so that's the idea is the Hopewell Indian. So um that that's the most interesting thing to me so of course because of my studies you know into you know, investigating it and then following you guys as your podcast and throughout the years i've listened to rod meldrum stuff and and kind of always in my mind personally um mm -hmm. i felt like if the book of mormon events happened anywhere they did happen at the in the in the upper midwest because mm -hmm. um first of all i just want to relate a, a personal story i the, one of the very first lds people i reached out to last fall literally it's last fall is the first time i reached out to an lds person mm -hmm. was a person on the book of merriman heartland reddit and it's he's a great guy and i just put posted on their reddit saying you know based on all my studies of the book of mormon and the history of the church the early documents of the history mm -hmm. of the church which we're going to get into um i think that if it happened anywhere it did happen in the heartland and of course, we became friends, fast friends, and he's been a fan of mine and encouraged me all along. 
So that was my first experience. So um, I am biased. Uh, of course, I forever will be <laughs> as a result. But I think that, you know, when you when we go back to the documents, I think it's important. But I do, I, I am fascinated by this map that you did. So what you did was, rather than, um, and I've got it here, what you did is the traditional oh, yeah. map is you have the, the hourglass, the classic hourglass mm -hmm. map, okay? which right. everybody uses the key word, the narrow neck of land, which is only mentioned one time in the book of ether. So it wasn't even mentioned by Nephite. And so you have one reference, but what you did was you just took basically the cardinal directions and different uh, things that you could map out and you, you put them on the top squares and maps. Mm -hmm. And then you basically just uh, roughly laid it onto the map of the United States. Um, what made you decide to do that? You know, that, that's an interesting question. There's, um, I, I thought, uh, let me just explain how I arrived at this approach. I, th I thought to myself, well, if Camorra's in New York, I want to test that hypothesis and see if the Book of Mormon describes North America. Because, you know, I'd grown up with the idea that of the hourglass shape that you're talking about, and that therefore, based on the hourglass shape, New York couldn't be the location of Camorra because it's too far away from Central America. But I, so I, first I challenged the hourglass shape and I thought, you know, there's really nothing in the Book of Mormon that describes an hourglass. And I can see why people reach that conclusion, but as you pointed out, it only refers to a narrow neck of land at one point. And so I started thinking, well, what would be a different approach? And that's when I mapped out this rough uh, map that you're referring to, the diagram sort of. With the, I, I pull it up here myself to, to double check it. But the land of Zarahemla is on the north, land of Nephi is on the south, and then there's these other features. And if you eliminate the idea that it was a narrow neck of land, you get just a land mass. And then when I blocked it out this way and I superimposed it over North America, it was a rough fit. As you know from reading the book, I wasn't satisfied with that because I wanted to see if the text itself and the hundreds of references also described North America more specifically. But that was the framework that I came up with to replace the, um, the hourglass shape. So basically you out, thought outside of the box using boxes on your map, yeah. right? <laughs> exactly. Well said, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, and, and so that's, that's like, uh, you know, so that, that's what happens. See, like uh, sometimes you need an outsider, like I'm kind of a fan of Barry Fell, right? Oh, yeah. Here's a guy who wrote uh -huh. America BC, and he's right. like looking things from the outside. And I like it when people, you have people from different fields kind of kind of crashing into another, but sometimes like uh, Fred Hoyle and others make these great discoveries that people within a particular group aren't even looking at because they're looking, they're, they're so in that box, they don't even see it. So you basically just rethought the mapping up and literally was able to figure out, hey, this actually roughly approximates to the upper Midwest of the United States and parts yeah. of Ontario and stuff. So. And, and, and part of the reason I really think it's important that we discuss why I think, and why of course, obviously you believe that these events happened um, partly was because um, we have early documentation from the church. Now this is the thing, now when you're doing scholarship, you don't go and look at the later document. For instance, that's why the book of Mark is the gospel that everybody goes to first because that's the oldest, right? right? So right. if you're a, a believer in the restoration and you believe that scripture was being written at this time and letters and, and that the apostles and prophets were on the land and they were writing and they were doing things. Um, if you look at those early documents, they will tell you that, uh, first of all, Joseph, the first mission he sends out is to the land, to the Lamanites, to, right. the, to the borders of the Lamanites. So they're going to Missouri and, and, and preaching to them. And then we have... Uh, well, and even there, when, when they first left, they talked to Indians in New York and Ohio as well, before they even got to Missouri. Right, yeah. And they called it the borders because that's where all the Indians were being pushed to, right? Yeah, and, right. and that was the terminology. So yeah, that was the first thing, because they believed that the Book of Mormon was written for the Lamanites, primarily, right? right? Yep. So that's what the first thing they did was, well, we got to go to the Lamanites. So um, now I've talked to somebody from another branch of the restoration and he, and, and because I brought up to him what we're going to talk about now, which is in addition to the early documents, which I want to still explore, but also the fact is, is that early on, we have Zion's camp, wandering mm -hmm. the plains and the Nephites, right. going to Zelf's mound, um, mm -hmm. 
encountering uh, somebody that he believed was a white Lamanite. Somebody told me, he said, no, they weren't a white Lamanite. They're white and they fight. I'm like, okay, you know, whatever terminology you want to use. Um, but uh, this person said, well, <clears throat> Joseph was never there, referring to not being in the time period of the Mormons. So he didn't know what he was talking about. What do you say to something like that? In the time period of the Nephites, you mean? Yeah, exactly. In other words, he was speculating like anybody else would. Yeah, right. I know. <laughs> that's what they say. But, you know, it, that's because they, they disregard what he wrote. Because he said that uh, Moroni told him about the, the people where they came from, their manner of living, you know, the mode of transportation and all that stuff. But it's, it's interesting, even before Zion's camp, in fact, I was just reviewing this recently. Heber C. Kimball, who joined the church in 1832 in New York, he talked about visiting the Hill Cumorah and seeing the embankments there and about the hilltop fortifications all in the area where he lived that he saw many times. And so th this was, you know, in, in their view of the location of Cumorah and the Book of Mormon was informed by their environment. That is absolutely true. Not only that, but see what most people who don't really know this subject at all, they need to understand that about 90 plus percent of the mounds that were existing early on in our history and even up to that time have been wiped out. They were used, but they were plowed over by farmers and destroyed and plundered. So very little evidence of them. There's substantial, still quite a bit, still five, 10 percent, but still compared to what we're talking about, this was a major civilization yeah. um, right. that, and, and and this was the world. So when people were getting the very first exposure to the Book of Mormon and looking at the text, this is the text that Brigham Young and others are reading, they knew that they were talking about the Midwest. They knew they were talking about the mounds. And part of it is, is that it, people don't realize this, but many, many Protestants at the time had a belief that the lost 12 tribes of Israel may have built the mounds, right? Right. That was a very mm -hmm. common popular idea. It wasn't yeah. out of, you know, so, so it wasn't as though Joseph just took something and made it up. This was part of the milieu of the time. Okay. Mm -hmm. And right. so a lot of Christians would have realized like, okay, this makes sense. But it does. But what makes this book so unique is he chose not to talk about. Well, if he was making it up, he didn't choose to do the ten tribes. The story right. is different. It reads differently than what you would expect from this time period. So That's you right. have believers who are Christians who know the Bible, who study the Book of Mormon, and they are able, to, in some sense, to pinpoint the location on the map in 1820, 1830, 1831. Well, and the other thing that people overlook is when they say Joseph was speculating was that he and Oliver Cowdery visited the repository of records at the Hill Camorra multiple times. And so it wasn't a theoretical thing to them. I mean, they had been there, they had seen the artifacts, they had seen all the records, and they knew they were there in New York. So, I, I mean, I guess theoretically, post Book of Mormon times, somebody could have hauled all those records to New York, not just the bridge place, but the entire storehouse of records, but that doesn't make sense. Plus, you know, the very first time that um, Moroni visited Joseph Smith, he told them the, the record had been written and deposited not far from his house, which means Mormon and Moroni had to live in that area. So none of this is speculation on Joseph's part. It's just what he was taught directly from Moroni and what he experienced when he went into the room of uh, records. You know, and, and some of the critics will say, well, you just got to go, go, go by what the text says, which is fine. Right. You want to go just by what the text. I think you, it, you, you're hypothesis can stand that right. scrutiny as well, right? But I do think that within the context of what the restoration stood for, that you have a living prophet and you have living apostles um, mm -hmm. and they are receiving revelation and all the branches to varying degrees, except some of them, okay? But the reality is early on, this is like before maybe some thought that Joseph was a fallen prophet and all that kind of stuff, before even right. David Whitmer would have thought. The reality is, is a lot of the early period of the church it was near universally accepted that this is where it happened and so i'm speaking to other groups that you know you need to understand that this is also part of your his early history as well right that's right and i should clarify one thing you know the joseph made that reference to the plains of the nephites yeah and there is the, the reference to zarahemla across from nauvoo but other than that there's no he didn't identify specific locations besides the hill Cumorah. so it was always we know for sure Camorra's in New York, 
The other locations we can't tell for sure, which makes sense because there were, as you pointed out, there were thousands of potential sites. It could be the name sites in the Book of Mormon. And, and to identify any particular one as a particular city is, is unlikely. Yeah. But he did recognize the plains of the Nephites. Now I know some of the, the uh, Mesoamerican guys will say, well, that phrase plains of the Nephites doesn't appear in the Book of Mormon. Therefore, it's not a Book of Mormon site. But there are several plains that are named in the Book of Mormon. Joseph didn't say this is the plains of whatever. He just said these are the plains of the Nephites. Uh, yes, that okay. That's a very good, excellent point. I hadn't even thought about that before. So, one thing I want to get back just just to kind of put a bow on the early document part is um, you wrote an interesting book called uh, Letter Number Seven mm -hmm. um, about Oliver Cowdery, and maybe talk right. a little bit about that because that's kind of kind of cinches the whole argument about where they thought Hill Cumorah was. Yeah, well, in there was a book in 1834 called Mormonism Unveiled that was published. It was kind of the first anti-Mormon book, so to speak. And in, Oliver Cowdery and Joseph realized that they had never really documented any church history to speak of. And so they wrote these series of eight letters. Well, they were eight essays, but they published them as letters because you could send letters through the mail easier if it was in a newspaper because of the, the postal expenses and so on. So they published them as letters. And in letter number seven, he, he described Hill Cumorah specifically. He said it was a fact that the final battles of the Jaredites and Nephites took place at that hill in New York. And he, he went on some length to describe the battles that took place there and, and so forth. And so that letter declared it was a fact. Joseph Smith had his scribes copy that into his own history as part of his life story. And then it was republished all eight letters, including letter seven, were republished multiple times in the Messenger and Advocate originally, and then in the Times and Seasons, the Millennial Star, um, the Prophet, which was a newspaper in New York, the Gospel Reflector, even the uh, Improvement Era out in Utah was republished. So it was fairly ubiquitous. In, in fact, in England, they published a special pamphlet of just those eight letters and one record indicated they sold 5,000 copies, which was quite a few for you know, the early 1840s. So this was a universally accepted thing in Joseph's day. And I, I wrote that book because I had never really heard of Letter 7, and I certainly didn't understand it, the implications of it. And it isn't just Letter 7. There's Letter number 4 talks about Moroni's first visit when he says the, the record was written and deposited near Joseph's home. And there's other important information in all those letters. But in Joseph's day, everybody knew letter seven. And I, th I felt like, well, why not in our day? Why do people or members of the restoration movement, whether they're LDS or not, should all be completely familiar with letter seven, just like people in Joseph's day were? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, and sometimes I think Oliver gets dismissed because of the, you know, there was issues and controversies that happened in splits and everything like that. Well, we have to understand that he was foundational to the faith early on. Yeah. And it wasn't just Joseph, it was Oliver, and it was the others that were also anointed as well. And when Oliver wrote that letter, he was the assistant president of the church. And it was, it was later after that in Kirtland when the Lord appeared to them in the Kirtland temple. So he, and he and Joseph together received the priesthood keys. It wasn't just Joseph Smith. And there, there's a lot more behind it, but basically Oliver Cowdery had equivalent credibility to Joseph Smith, particularly because he had accompanied Joseph to the uh, storage place with all the records in the Hill Camorra. So the two of them were the witnesses of that. So I think that's an important thing for people to realize that that's, yeah. you know, sometimes history gets written by the ones that have an agenda sometimes, right? <laughs> and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, uh, and it's, it's an inconvenient fact that he was a very important person early on. And, you know, so that kind of leads me to, okay, so here we have a situation where, you know, uh, I think a very superficial reading of the Book of Mormon would be a hemispheric. Well, you got Northland, right. Southland, and Narrow land, right? And there could have been some people early on that might have envisioned that, but that was, that would have been a very superficial reading of the book. But as we get into, um, we're moving into the Nauvoo period, and we've got the Times and Seasons publication, mm -hmm. and now this idea is introduced into the bloodstream. Right. that perhaps these things didn't happen in the heartland, but they happened somewhere else. Tell us about mm -hmm. that. 
Okay, well, there's a, a couple of angles on that. First, even before they moved to Nauvoo, uh, Parley and Orson Pratt were, and Benjamin Winchester were writing articles about these themes. And for example, Benjamin Winchester had the newspaper called the Gospel Reflector based in Philadelphia, where he was, he included the eight letters from Oliver Cowdery that dealt with Camorra, but he also speculated about a, a wider uh, scope for the Book of Mormon. And he specifically was excited about the ruins they had discovered in Central America because he felt those were confirmation or evidence of the Book of Mormon. And then the Pratt brothers, both Parley and Orson, also followed that line of thinking that any evidence of ancient civilization in the Americas, whether North, Central, or South America, was evidence of the Book of Mormon. Of course, at the time, archaeology was not that sophisticated, and they didn't have a sense for the dating of the various civilizations, the genetic diversity or origins of them, and so forth. And so by the time they got to Nauvoo, uh, I guess it was Orson Pratt had written a pamphlet in 1840 where he kind of explained uh, the origin of the church. He talked about, it was called um, An Account of Several Remarkable Visions. And he talked about um, the, the Book of Mormon specifically, and he had discussed how the native people, the Indians in Central, South and North America were Book of Mormon people. When Joseph Smith wrote the Wentworth letter, which was published in March uh, 1st of 1842, he followed much of Orson Pratt's uh, pamphlet, some of it word for word. But when he got to that section about the, the um, Lamanites being in Central and South America, he deleted that whole thing. And all he said was, the, the, uh, the remnant of Lehi are the Indians that live in this country. So when, if you compare those two documents side by side, you can see that he explicitly rejected that whole Central and South American thing. And that's why he made the declarative statement. I mean, it's hard to be any more specific than to say the remnant are the Indians that live in this country, right? If you take that in the abstract, you, maybe you could massage it and say, well, he really meant the entire hemisphere or whatever. But when you go back to those letters that Oliver Cowdery wrote, where Moroni specifically told Joseph Smith that they were the Aborigines who lived in this country. And then Joseph picked up that same phrase to use in the Wentworth letter. You can see a direct line from Moroni's first visit all the way through the Wentworth letter that rejected the Central and South American stuff. So what, what happened after that was, well, well, let me just back up to say, what happened in the Times and Seasons was Joseph Smith took over the nominal editorship in 1842 for about six months, six or eight months. During that time, there were several articles published that referred to the ruins in North America, but also Central and South America. And so people inferred that Joseph Smith either wrote those articles or approved of them. The problem is that it was just an assumption. He never signed the articles. He never referred to them. He never cited them or quoted them. And so when I, my, the first book I wrote about all this stuff had to do with the authorship of those articles. And in my view, the historical evidence shows that it was Benjamin Winchester who was writing the articles, mailing them out to Nauvoo, and William Smith, who was the acting actual editor of the Times and Seasons, was publishing them. That's a whole long digression. But the point is, there's nothing in those articles to show that Joseph specifically endorsed them. In fact, he resigned after from the Times and Seasons after the Times and Seasons published an article saying that Zarahemla was down in Guatemala. That was the last issue that had his name on it. He said, after this, I'm done. And, and so it gets into a discussion of how hands-on was he at the Times and Seasons. And when you, when you consider that he never felt comfortable with writing, he was always having scribes do the writing. He was very busy. During this period, Wilfred Woodruff made a comment that Joseph hardly has time to sign his name to documents that we prepare for him. So the idea that he was a hands-on editor is just not historically uh, congruent with the evidence. But his name was on there, but his name was also on the Times and Seasons as the printer. And no one's saying he was down there setting type and running the printing press either. So he was, he was a nominal printer, he's a nominal editor. These articles were incorrectly attributed to him when he had already in the Wentworth letter explicitly rejected that whole Central and South American stuff. What happened later, it became complicated because subsequent uh, prophets and apostles started referring to the people in Central and South America as Lamanites. And historically, there's nothing in church history that supports that. 
other than these statements. But if you look at it genetically or um, anthropologically, there was a lot of mixture with people throughout the Americas post Book of Mormon time. So in my view, it's, it's legitimate to call them Lamanites if you wanna call them Lamanites, even though the majority of people in Latin America are of European origin, you know, <laughs> which is kind of bizarre, but. So that's, uh, that's probably a longer answer than you wanted, but I wanted to give the full context there. No, I, I, it's important that people understand it because, you know, um, they're like, you know, Pratt's edition had like the landing spot being in Chile and all that right. kind of stuff. So there is documentation that does, but it's not directly tied to Joseph. And then it really, it's really late 1830s, 1840s before this idea. When you're doing scholarship, you want to go with the earliest extant documents. Yeah. And that's how you do it, because then you know what the received, the initial re readers, how where they perceived it to be. The book was written to the people of that time and the, and explained to them the world that they lived in and what they were seeing. So yeah. that I think is important because we live in a we live in the United States, but we live in a completely different world than they lived in. Right. For sure. So we well, and, and getting back to you mentioned Pratt's note about being in Chile and those footnotes he put in the 1879 Book of Mormon. He was very careful to distinguish between what was a fact and what was a supposition or a theory. And he would say, for example, it is believed that uh, Zarahemla was in Colombia. But he would say specifically, the Hill Camorra is in Manchester in New York. So he, he was careful to, to, I guess, equivocate about other ideas besides Camorra. So as we venture forth into the 20th century, we start getting some scholars out there that start advocating this model, right. the Mesoamerican right. model. Maybe just briefly touch on the origins of that and how that all started. Okay, well, it started with um, a, a brother in the uh, reorganized church, his last name was Stebbins, but it was really L.E. Hills, who was a scholar in the reorganized church, who developed the two Camorras theory. And he published a map in 1917 that showed Camorra down in Central America. And the reason he did was there was a book published in the early 1900s by Charles Shook called Camorra Revisited. And I don't know if you've, if you've read about all this stuff, but I, I'll just try to do it quickly. So Charles Shook's analyzed the Book of Mormon and said there's no archaeological evidence that supports it. And he assumed that there had only been one origin of the Native Americans in North America. He hadn't, he didn't, at the time, he didn't know about the difference between the Hopewell and the Adena, which correspond to the Nephites and the Jaredites. So he said, the Book of Mormon talks about two different civilizations, but we know there is only one civilization. Of course, subsequent discoveries showed there really were two separate civilizations. But so in response to Charles Shook book, the um, L.E. Hills, developed this two Camorras theory where he, and he had a map, which is basically the same one that uh, John Sorensen uses today and the other uh, Mesoamerican proponents, where he showed all the events of the Book of Mormon taking place in, in a limited area of Mesoamerica. In response to his book or, and his map, the LDS church deleted all the Orson Pratt references because they involve Central America and South America, primarily South America. So they deleted all those references and they decided they had a committee James Talmadge was involved with where they decided not to have an opinion any further on Book Mormon geography. Well, this two Camorra theory started to gain some credence in LDS circles, even though it originated with L.E. Hills. And so um, Joseph Fielding Smith published an editorial. He was a church historian and an apostle for 20 years. He published an editorial denouncing this idea of two Camorras, of Camorra being in Central America. And so there was a, a debate back and forth over several decades until in the 1950s and 60s, there were books being published on both sides, articulating both views. But by the 1970s and 80s, the Mesoamerican thing just took over primarily due to uh, John Sorensen, who had a lot of credibility as a BYU professor. But there is also David Palmer, who published a book about In Search of Camorra, that was kind of the first book that said that he eliminated New York as a possibility. And then John Sorensen and Jack Welch and Dan Peterson, those guys all kind of built on and worked with John Sorensen to develop the Mesoamerican thing. You know, and it's interesting because um... It's been over 100 years and all these resources have been poured into, okay, yeah. trying to do the Mesoamerican right. model. 
And yeah. if you read the history of Thomas Ferguson, he was right. another person who went there and he was looking for evidence and he didn't yeah. find the evidence he was looking for. And if you read the history of him, you kind of see where that ends up a little bit. Well, Thomas Ferguson was a classic case of unrealistic expectations not being fulfilled because he expected to find a specific thing, right? And didn't find it, so he was disillusioned. In fact, most people who are disappointed or unhappy is because their expectations don't align with reality. But he was one of the most classic cases of that. And in our day, I think the, uh, the Mesoamerican scholars have kind of concluded, well, we don't have the evidence that we hoped we have, but there's still lots to be uncovered and we think it's still gonna be there someday. The irony of this whole thing is as you pointed out early on that the text of the Book of Mormon is the main source, but the text says nothing about the Western Hemisphere or the Americas. And so why is anybody even looking in the Western Hemisphere? It's because of what Joseph and Oliver said. If it wasn't for what Joseph and Oliver said about it, there would be no reason to limit the Book of Mormon. That's why you have some people that say the Book of Mormon took place in Eritrea or Malaysia or wherever. But if you limit your search to um, the Western Hemisphere, it's because of what Joseph and Oliver taught, and yet they reject what Joseph and Oliver taught on, about Camorra. So it just makes no sense, it, logically. You know, I think of the Tree of Life Stella that they yeah. used for about 50 years saying, and then finally they right. realized, well, the tree, and that's a, a Mayan uh, Stella that uh, they thought maybe proved the Lehi's vision in stone. Well, then right. we had, uh, but I always thought the great irony is we actually have, we'll put aside some of the evidence that some use uh, for, uh, but there are two pieces I think that are, so, some scholars think might be legitimate and that would be the Back Creek Stone and the Ohio right. Decalogue Stone. And I think right. I mentioned to you before that if they found anything like that in Mesoamerica, every <laughs> LDS household would have a replica of it right next to their Lyahonia and the plates, right? Right, exactly, <laughs> for sure. So. Yeah. You know, and, and because there actually is some scholars that think that those two pieces might actually there. I mean, yeah. we actually have secular people who are non-believers who actually think there's some credence to that. So imagine right. if there were something like that found in Guatemala, that would have been huge. It would have been a big yeah. event. So I think people That's need cool. to understand the context of, you know, the bias has been going in one direction for so long. And this is really a scholar thing, right? We're not talking about spiritual. We're talking leaders. We're talking Absolutely. about scholars. I think that's important. And, and along those lines, too, you know, there, there's long lists of what they call correspondences between Central America and the Book of Mormon, but they're really aspects of human culture everywhere in the world. You could find correspondences between the Book of Mormon and ancient China. I've, I've been to uh, um, Cambodia, you know, Angkor Wat and the other ruins down there. And if you go through just what you see on the, those temple walls, it looks directly out of the Book of Mormon with chariots and horses and everything you can imagine. And so in that sense, the evidence that they cite for Central America is all, in my view, kind of just pure confirmation bias. It's, it, there's nothing um, specific there that you wouldn't find in other cultures. They're only looking down there because of this hourglass interpretation that they've had. So... That's, that's an important point, too. That's why there's, there's no, if you go by just the text, there's no reason to limit your search to the Western Hemisphere. But if you limit your search to the Western Hemisphere, it's because of what Joseph and Oliver said. So why are you rejecting what else they said? Think outside of the box. Yeah. Look at the boxes. Okay. I think right. that's a way to look at it. So I want to uh, kind of just tease our next segment a little bit here, because, you know, one of the things that really fascinated me about uh, our conversation or about what I, uh, some conversations I've heard you on some podcasts is uh -huh. you um, acknowledge certain things, you accept certain scholarship about the Book of Mormon that there would be 19th century, 17th century, quote unquote, anachronisms in the Book of Mormon right. uh, because of how you view the translation process occurred. And you have a viewpoint. I just want to briefly touch it on, on this now because I want to then maybe talk a little bit about it in our next segment. But essentially, because I, I question you because you basically said, yeah, Joseph Smith had a seer stone. And mm -hmm. now just so that for outsiders, the standard, the, the story as long as that the Urim and Thummim were the primary means of translating the Book of Mormon. That was the story that, that was the story that was told for generations to the church. 
recently mm -hmm. with what's called the gospel topics essays um, and a lot of the scholarship, a lot of now more educated or the scholarly types are advocating uh, that no, he didn't use the Yerman Thummim, but he used a seer stone. Now mm -hmm. you recognize the fact that Joseph had a seer stone, correct? Right. And so, it, and you had mentioned that that was something that was very commonly used by folk, you know, that was kind of just a folk, folk back then just had seer stones. They had dowsing mm -hmm. rods and things like that, correct? Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's correct. Sure. Okay, so that's the world that he was living in. Um, yeah. So I think, what this this is I'm going to segue here because I think uh, what we're going to talk about next is really important because I think you've come across an important discovery that I think is going to be going to this new book that you have coming out I'm really excited about so we're mm -hmm. going to wrap up here we're going to okay. uh, get ready for our segment but um, first of all I want to thank everyone for watching and listening. Uh, I appreciate your comments and the feedback I've been getting has just been absolutely tremendous. I just remind you to like and subscribe. And I'm going to leave a link to Moroni's America in the description. And I'm also going to leave a link to uh, the Heartland subreddit that got me involved in this in the first place and also to your Moroni's America website as well. So right. I want to thank you all for joining us and uh, we'll stay tuned for part two. <laughs>